Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding a State and Trust Administration, presented by Elville & Associates Managing Principal and Lead Attorney Stephen Elville. My name is Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director with Elville & Associates, and I'll be moderating today's event. So how this will work today, if you're new to our webinars, if you are, welcome. We're glad you're here. And if you're coming back to see us again, thank you as always for your support and for being here as well. So you as the attendee are currently in listen-only mode. However, as always, if and when you have questions, please note them in the questions panel on the right-hand portion of your screen. And we will take time throughout the presentation to address all your questions. We encourage questions as always, they help others learn and they add value to the presentation. So please don't be shy in posing your questions at any time. You receive the presentation and two checklists as well that Steve will be referencing during the presentation to take notes on them if you wish. If for some reason you did not receive the presentation and checklist, they are available to download in the section marked handouts in the panel on your screen to download at this time. For our professionals on the webinar today, our CFPs, CPAs, and others, you may receive 1.5 continuing education hours for attending. So per my attendance records requirements, as always, if I don't have it already, please email me your ID number. And for CFPs only, I also must have the last four digits of your social security number as soon as possible so I can submit your CE hours for approval. Everyone will also receive a post-webinar feedback email right after the presentation. And we do ask that you please just take a couple minutes to fill out this simple survey to offer us your feedback about the presentation. We read and value every comment that you offer us. It's also an ideal time to request a consultation with Steve for any planning needs that your family and you may have now or in the future. And we always look forward to being a resource to you here at Elbow Associates at any time. So briefly, as we have a lot to cover, I wanna offer you an overview about our firm and tell you a little bit about Steve if you're not familiar with him. So you should be able to, actually not yet, you should be able to see my screen right now. Elbow and Associates, we were founded in 2010 in Columbia by managing principal and lead attorney Stephen Elville. We have a number of different practice areas. We're a hybrid firm that we focus on here. We're coming to you live from the Columbia location here. We focus in estate and special needs planning, elder law and elder care planning, estate and trust administration, business law and succession planning, guardianship and litigation, tax planning and asset protection. We have seven attorneys, 12 staff members, and five locations. Our mission, as it always has been and always will be, is to pro provide practical solutions to our clients' needs through counseling, education, and superior legal technical knowledge. We do focus on and offer a lot of education here at Elville and Associates, and we do that in several ways, through our planning processes with our clients, through over 100 educational webinars and workshops in the communities we, that we serve each year, and also by way of our accredited client care program. We are only one of two firms in Maryland to have what we call our CCP, accredited by the Client Care Academy in Boston. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please let me know. I'd be happy to share some information with you about it. We also work with the ideals of client education, collaboration, and compassion in mind with every client, every time, every day. A little bit about Steve. Steve's work as an attorney for the past 20 plus years, 22 to be exact, has been centered in elder law, special needs planning, and estate planning, with an emphasis in the areas of tax planning and asset protection, a member of many different national organizations, the Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, the Academy of Special Needs Planners, the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys, working to bring peace of mind to clients by creating solutions to their needs through, through counseling, client education, and the use of leading edge legal, legal technical knowledge. A very seasoned speaker, if you haven't heard Steve speak, presenting at many webinars, conferences, continuing education events each year. Also named to the Maryland Super Lawyers List for a seventh time in 2022, so congratulations to Steve. And also a feature story written about him in the National Super Lawyers Magazine, 
about the Elville Center for the Creative Arts, which is our firm's charitable organization he founded in 2014. And I am very fortunate to be the executive director of. So if you'd like to learn more about the Elville Center's story and how we're working to make a musical difference in the lives of children each day, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to share our story with you. So with all that said, we are going to go ahead and get started. We have a brief poll that I wanna run by you just to get an idea of who we have on our presentation today. Let's see what's brought you here. And the poll is, what has your experience been with a state and trust administration to date? I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. And your choices are, I have been the executor of an estate in the past, or two, as an executor, I sought professional guidance throughout. Three, I may be asked to be an executor of an estate in the future. Four, I want to keep my planning in order to keep administration costs down. Or lastly, I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So just take a minute to make the choice that best suits your situation. And we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, well, I think everybody that has wanted to participate has. So nobody says they've been the executor of an estate in the past. 8% says, say, as an executor, I sought professional guidance throughout. 28% say, I may be asked to be an executor of an estate. 42% say, I want to keep my planning in order to keep administration costs down. Interesting. And 19% say, I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So thank you for being here. Steve, actually, I need to make you the presenter, so let's Thank go ahead and do you. that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jeff. It looks like I am now the presenter. I'm going to get myself in a position here to show my screen. There it is. And uh, good morning, everyone. And by the way, Jeff, I think we have a major client event coming up, and you may be saying uh, something about that before we end today. So I, I want will. to know about that. I'm going to start my st slideshow. And good morning, everyone, and thank you, Jeff. Um, it's just a beautiful day here, springtime in Maryland. I'm looking out my window here in conference room one at Elville and Associates, and uh, I just feel blessed to be here this morning to uh, share some time with you. Thank you for spending your very valuable time with me and Jeff this morning as we try to give you the, the summary or compilation of our experience, my experience per se, in the last 22 years of a state and trust administration and hopefully impart something to you that we try to do every quarter here at Elville and Associates to really be of a, a resource to you and, and really try to get your minds around, get our minds around uh, the, the, the fundamentals of administration because this is one of the major parts of estate planning. We have, in our view, three major phases of estate planning. We have the uh, implementation phase, which we want to take a lot of time to think through issues. Then we have the maintenance and updating phase, which none of us really want to think about that much, but that is a critical piece to make the planning work the way it's supposed to. And that's the piece that's often ignored. And then we have the third phase, which is the final trust or state administration phase. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I know that many of you have various situations. I heard heard loud and clear that 42% of you want to learn how to minimize cost and make, make sure things are as efficient as possible in administration. So I appreciate that. And I know we have advisors and non-advisors, and we have clients and prospective clients of all kinds. And I also know that some of you may have experienced a death in the family or you're acting as an executor or a trustee. Now, our condolences to you, and we know this is not an easy process. So again, for, for whatever reasons you are here, welcome. Jeff is an expert moderator. He will keep us on the straight and narrow path to the finish, and he will uh, field questions if you have them. He'll interrupt me if we have questions. 
Uh, but otherwise, I want you to see this kind of as a mini master class about everything we can possibly do within about an hour and 15 minutes to bring you into the world of state and trust administration. It, it's a very big world. It's, it's both a science and an art. Uh, it is uh, a complex subject uh, involving tax, involving um, just all kinds of processes and re responsibilities and, and, and accounting and all kinds of fundamental things. So the only thing we can do is just really dive in. And again, thank you for being here. I hope you get something substantive from this. As we begin, you'll notice that I've provided, Jeff has provided checklists. And these are estate administration checklists. These are trust administration checklists. And that's the first thing that I want you to really be aware of as we get started. This is a process. This is a predictable process most of the time. Now, there, there are situations where administration goes into a chaotic mode for no other reason than uh, the parties that are involved or problems among beneficiaries. But generally speaking, a state administration and trust administration can be orchestrated in a certain way and it can be a smooth and very enjoyable in some instances process of as far as the uh, the administration side of it. So just know those checklists are critical. All right, well again, thank you for being here today. Let's get started. And again, it's my privilege to present to you today. So we're going to unravel the mystery of what happens when someone dies, whether they are a loved one or someone else that you are administering an estate or trust for. We want to minimize confusion and we always want to provide maximum support. Family members are in a time of crisis at a time of someone's death. Um, and this is just a, a, a not going to change. I mean, there are some people that uh, that handle this better than others. Um, and, and even the ones that are handling it well, we know they're in a time of crisis and we have to keep that in mind we have to know there's a legal step-by-step -step process that needs to take place. Now, for those CPAs and other professionals that are on the call here today, we know that in the professional side of things, we know there are highest and best practices, and we want to try to reach those highest and best practices. And then there are less than ideal practices. And the truth is that one way or the other, we are eventually going to get to the end at, a, at some point. But we always want to take the highest and best practices route, not only for the protection of the beneficiaries and for the fiduciary, meaning you as a trustee or an executor. Uh, we have to protect you. We have to keep that in mind as well. And the way to do that is to, and, and not only to honor the wishes of the decedent, is to make sure we are in the highest and best, best practice uh, path. There are also practical steps, and we're going to we're going to follow down a path of what are those practical steps. And then I'm going to try to comp compose this in, in in terms of what are the most significant and problematic legal issues that uh, executors, uh, ad administrators, advisors should be aware of, and how should uh, fiduciaries and trustees and advisors and CPAs all work together. Okay, these are these are part of the puzzle that we're going to try to put together. So after the death of someone, whether they are a family member or a non-family member, uh, this is obviously one of our clients' greatest concerns. Uh, a client's greatest concern, a family's greatest concerns. How do we move forward from here? Well, there are two paths, basically. We have probate and we have non-probate. So with wills or with no will, we could have a probate process. And with a trust, we know we have to administer that trust. And there's a transitionary period. So one of the things that I find in legal practice that is the greatest source of confusion to clients and of course, there's many sources of confusion out there, but most people don't understand that there is a transitionary period. So if I had the ability to explain this to you by way of a whiteboard illustration or some kind of a computer illustration, I would show you that whether we have a, a will-based plan or a trust-based plan, after the death of someone, that plan has to be administered. And this is the transitionary administration period that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a period of weeks or months, usually it's months, and hopefully not years, 
but months where this administration has to take place. And what we're going to talk about is this transitionary period. And ultimately, we have a distribution after the transitionary period. So the best thing to do in mentally to envision this is to say that after someone's death, we're going to have um, an administrative period, or maybe another way of looking at it is a transitionary period. We want to ask practical things like who is who is here for the surviving spouse? Who is who is supporting the children? Do distributions need to be made? And there are various ways that distributions and, and mandatory uh, support distributions can be made at times. Uh, so what what do you do as an administrator, as a fiduciary? When I use the term fiduciary, now I'm talking about a personal representative or what Maryland uh, some other states, I should say, call the executor of a will uh, or of a probate estate if there is no will. And I'm talking about a trustee for a trust. This is the fiduciary that we're talking about, the fiduciary responsibility. What do you do in these circumstances? You should be driven by a process. And Jeff and I like to say when we're giving webinars, that we are intentionally redundant. We are saying certain things two, three, four times so that we're driving home this idea. We want to be driven by process and not by circumstances. Now, sometimes you are driven by circumstances, facts and circumstances, not of your own creation. And that's, that's just the way it is. And you're going to have to kind of take the ball and run with it under those circumstances. But even under those circumstances, we wanna to try to get that under control and be driven by an overriding process. And obviously, the person who passed away, in a perfect world, we would want them to be prepared, prepared through education and having done their, their planning in a methodical way and to be organized and have everything ready for you, the fiduciary, so that your life and your job is easier and we know this is oftentimes not the case. But again, best practices, not only for administration, but best practices prior to administration, understanding those three major things, the implementation or process of, of getting the estate planning in order. And this is something that has to do with education and family education and making sure that assets are properly funded, making sure everything is organized. I once had a very very nice, very good financial advisor tell me, Steve, you are great with education, but what about organization? We need to make sure that clients are organized. This is going to make your life as a fiduciary and your, your fiduciaries at your passing much, much easier. Now, I'm going to give you some case examples today. Many of you love these case examples or, or, or really focus on them and have asked me to really expound more on them as we go through each quarter and we give this presentation. And there is no uh, right or wrong about these examples. I'm just trying to give you the most I can give you in, in four different examples of maybe a, a plan where everything is perfectly clear. Maybe there's a plan where there's a lot of assets that are of various types, uh, non-probate assets, retirement type assets, assets where the survivor's situation is not exactly what we thought it would be. Uh, and it has a certain kind of uh, a specific need, okay? Or maybe there's a fact pattern where we're not in control of the initial circumstances. There was no plan or it was a very poor plan. And uh, the fiduciary has to do sometimes what we have to do in elder law. We have to make judgment calls and it's not quite 100% clear. And we're seeing all kinds of situations like that today. So you have to be um, flexible and you have to always gravitate to the highest and best practices that are process driven, but you're not going to be able to articulate what fact situation you're gonna be dealing with. All you can do if you're a client or a potential client is try to prepare the way for your fiduciaries. And if you're thrust into a situation of being an executor or a trustee for someone else, you're going to have to be flexible and go with the flow given the fact pattern that you are giving given at that time. Let's go into this fact pattern here. If you've got a pen and pencil or a pen and paper, 
Uh, this is the time to start writing. This is the time to make notes. Get on your iPad or your, your computer. Here we have fact pattern number one. We have a gentleman who passed away. He was never married. And I'm calling him Felix. For those of you who are older, we know uh, of uh, an old television show that had someone like this. But anyway, I'm digressing. This person was never married, uh, age 77, and they had one child, Charles. Now, Felix, when he died, he had a residence. He had checking savings and CDs. He had cash of $200,000. He had IRAs of $400,000, okay? And we know many people today are saving lots of money in IRAs and 401ks and 403bs. And look at this, he had savings bonds savings bonds of $350,000. So he was quite an accumulator of savings bonds. He made no lifetime gifts, no creditors at his death, and he had social security income. Now let's look at this bottom bullet point here. His estate plan was a will, and by all, def uh, all evidence here, he had a simple will. And his will says, everything goes to my son Charles outright. Okay, so what are we looking at here in a nutshell? Well, if you are the personal representative of this estate, you're going to be taking uh, Felix's will to the register of wills. You're going to open up a regular estate. This is a regular estate because it's more than $50,000. He was single. And you are going to get letters of administration. Now, if you're looking at the critical dates checklist, we're going to be looking at the estate checklist, the one that has the personal representative at the top. Now, what would you normally do here? Well, normally you're going to be selling Felix's residence. You're going to be marshalling or gathering his assets. You're going to get an EIN number, a tax ID number for the estate. You're going to take that letter of administration from the register of wills, that official letter with the raised seal. You're going to take that to a bank. You're going to open a checking or checking account for the estate. You're going to use a tax ID number. You're going to take this cash. You're going to move it to the estate checking account. Your IRAs here that, that Felix had, what are, what are you going to do? You're going to facilitate that Charles gets the IRA. And let's presume, let's just make the big assumption that this IRA was beneficiary designated properly to Charles. Charles now has up until the fall of the year following Felix's death. Now that's a mouthful. He has up until the fall of the year following Felix's death. You don't want to wait that long, but if you were the executor or personal representative of this estate, you would be facilitating that Charles would make a death claim on this. Is there any inheritance tax here? And the answer is no, there is no 10% inheritance tax here because Charles is a lineal descendant by all evidence here in this fact pattern. So Charles gets a $400,000 inherited IRA and under the SECURE Act rules, what do we know? Well, we know that Charles apparently here is healthy and well, we see nothing to the contrary there. And therefore Charles gets how many years to take this IRA out and have to pay tax on it. You, you, you've got it, he's got 10 years. He is not exempt, he is not disabled, he is not chronically ill from this fact pattern, he is not a surviving spouse, uh, he is not less than 10 years younger than, than a sibling, so that's, that's, that exception is out the window, and he's not a minor. So he does not meet any of the five exceptions to the SECURE Act, so therefore he's got 10 years to take this out. Now, what would have happened if the IRA was beneficiary designated to the estate of Felix, or it just had no beneficiary? Well, now that would have been a bit of a disaster for ordinary income tax, because now all the tax would have to be paid on that within five years. Now, let's go to the savings bonds. Here, what do we know about savings bonds? Well, savings bonds are considered to be what is called income in respect to a decedent, IRD, IRD. That simply means that someone's got to pay the tax on these. They're kind of like IRAs. So what the, the lawyer or the CPA that's involved in this particular administration is going to do 
and you as a fiduciary would do is determine what's the best thing to do here. Should uh, Felix's final tax return show all this income? Should Felix's estate tax return, meaning the form 1041, which is a fiduciary tax return, should that show all of the, or part of the income? Or should Charles show part of the income? So the point here is to try to minimize the income tax, not the estate tax, the income tax that is going to be paid on these savings bonds. So hopefully this fact pattern here starts to get our get us warmed up to the idea that this is this is the kind of thing that would happen in an administration. The assets are basically uh, controlled now by the personal representative. And what is the personal representative going to do if we are administering this as a regular estate? They are going to provide an accounting. Now, there is such a thing as a modified uh, administration, uh, and, and there are rules about that. We won't, won't get into that today. But this is just making the broad assumption that an estate that you might administer is a regular estate, and you're going to have to provide an accounting. So what happens here is, in, as you notice on the, um, on the checklist here, that the first accounting is due within nine months. Creditors can make claims, but here there are no creditors, okay? And now after around nine months, uh, it can be done sooner. The personal representative would have an accounting if this was treated as a regular estate, and they would get that signed off by the Register of Wills. There are 20 days to have exceptions or objections, and if no one objects, then this will be distributed to Charles. Now, obviously, under this fact pattern, Charles, who is a surviving um, son, he might be the personal representative, but I'm teaching here as if this was hypothetically something that you would be administering. Fact pattern number two, here we have a married person, um, and here we have um, Jack, Jack is married to Janet, and they have three kids. And assets here include a, a residence, checking and savings, so we have cash, we have IRAs or 401ks here. Look at this, we have a brokerage account. We have a, we have a brokerage account, an investment account. We have life insurance. And look, Jack and Janet have a Delaware residence. Now this could be a Florida residence, it could be a South Carolina residence, here I'm just using uh, the lower, slower shore of Delaware as an example. They've made no lifetime gifts. Now let's talk about this. How, how much can they gift? And this is a big source of confusion. Well, right now, each spouse can gift $12,060,000. That may sound hard to believe, but the gift tax exemption is actually 12060 excuse me, $12,060,000 per person or 24 million between two spouses. Now this is the unified credit for estate and gift tax purposes, but that's why you're seeing me refer here to the issue of whether or not gifts have been made, okay? And that's a little bit of a discussion outside of today's presentation. Let's look at the bottom bullet point here. What kind of estate plan do Jack and Janet have? They have a revocable trust. Now this could be a joint family trust, one revocable trust for both people, meaning they're a long-term, long-time married couple. They have children from the same marriage. They are uh, basically a traditional couple, or this could be for various reasons, two separate trusts. Jack could have his trust, Janet can have her trust. The discussion here, it does not matter uh, which, which arrangement they have. So here we have a fairly straightforward situation. We have a surviving spouse, and let's just make the assumption here, as the bottom bullet point says, everything goes outright to Janet. She can disclaim for tax purposes if she needs to, but everything is outright to her. So basically, this is very straightforward. The residence gets retitled to Janet, and in particular to her trust, her continuing trust. All of the cash moves over to her. We'll skip the IRAs for just a second. All of the brokerage accounts move over to her. Life insurance gets a death claim. Janet is going to claim those assets. The Delaware residence moves over to her. And what do we know about these 
non-retirement assets, we know that they get a cost basis adjustment at death. We know that Uncle Sam did not take that away last uh, year. So thank goodness for that. And she will get a step up in basis of a, to a certain degree on these assets. Um, so when we have one spouse who dies on the death of the first spouse, especially with a traditional type couple that this is saying here, that, that, that these couple, this couple is, we are basically moving the assets over and the administration is relatively straightforward. Jack's portion of the joint trust, if this was a joint trust, or Jack's trust, if he had a separate trust, becomes irrevocable at his death, irrevocable, and it has to be administered. And as you notice, now when you look at your trust checklist, you'll notice that many of these procedures are the same. We're gonna go through this in a little bit more detail. There's no jumping through hoops with the register of wills, but the same high level process driven type uh, process is, is, the, is relatively the same. And you're gonna, some of you may find that surprising today. So what am I concerned about here? If I, if I look at this fact pattern, well, I'm concerned that Janet make her death claims on the IRAs. And what do we know about that? Well, Janet is a surviving spouse. So she has more choices than if these IRAs were to have gone to the children. She can roll that over to her own IRA or she can take an inherited IRA. Now, most of the time, just based on this fact pattern, she's going to just take a rollover IRA and she's going to go on with her life. So that's something that would have to happen. But what am I more concerned about here? I am more concerned that Janet make a post-death election. And that post-death election that I'm concerned about that she make under these, uh, these facts is that she make the portability election. And what is the portability election? That election has got to be made for federal purposes within 24 months of Jack's death. What does portability do? Portability allows Janet to take Jack's unused exemption this is his unused exemption amount for estate tax, which we know at this, this day and time would be uh, 12 million. He made no gifts during his life. So she would be able to take that 12 million, 60,000, move it over to her column and be able to use that and lock that in. That's called the portability election. Now, looking at their assets here, one might argue, well, they don't have, you know, $24 million. Why would why would Janet make this tax election? It's going to cost money to create the uh, tax return, which is the form 706, and the subsequent form MET1. This is the Maryland estate tax return. And we know that Maryland has a 5 million exemption from estate tax for state estate tax purposes. Uh, so Janet is able to not only port the 12 million, she's able to port the 5 million. Why would she do that? Well, in my opinion, she would because we don't know what the exemption amounts are going to be in the future. So Janet would, at, assumingly at the time of Jack's death, she would have a $12 million exemption as well. But what, were, what was going to happen last year? There was discussion that this was going to drop to maybe five and a half million adjusted for inflation to maybe six and a half million. And in 2026, we, we know that the law is slated to drop these exemptions down to five and a half million plus uh, an inflationary factor. So Janet's exemption amount is not guaranteed what it's going to be in the future. So I think uh, most people should make the portability election, but of course, Janet does not have to do that. She does not have to pay several thousand dollars to have that form completed, uh, but I think it's advisable and I would always recommend that that happen unless there's a strong resistance to doing that. Now, let's look down at the bottom bullet point here. We have everything going outright to Janet. We have hopefully the portability election being made within a timely fashion. But what if Janet had, uh, excuse me, what if Jack had died? And what if the revocable trust had said something different? What if it had said uh, some, some uh, formula clause? Now, what is a formula clause? Many of you may have older trusts, or you may see an older trust, or even a new trust that has a formula clause. And that formula clause basically says, how much is going to go to the marital share, meaning 
over into Janet's column, so to speak, for the surviving spouse, and how much is going to go to the non-marital share? Back over to Jack's side of the column. And we don't have time to get into all of the details about the marital and non-marital share today, but that's going to affect the administration at Jack's death. Let's say that Jack has what I would call an old-fashioned formula clause from the late 90s or the early 2000s, or even something that might have been placed into the document today. Uh, and let's say that a non-marital trust needed to be established or a marital trust needed to be established. Those trusts have their own tax ID numbers. Those are also things that have to be taken care of during the administrative process after the death of one spouse, in addition to the portability election. And one of those elections might be the Q-tip election or the marital trust election if Jack had left a trust for Janet in the, in the marital share. So these types of, of, of things are things you have to consider in the months and weeks after the first spouse dies. Getting through this fact pattern so we can go on to other things as quickly as possible. Here is a similar situation, uh, but now it's 20 years later. Same couple, Janet has now passed away. Janet has passed away and look, she is now living in a different place. And we have a different situation. We have a different factual situation. A child of one of the three children is disabled. They, have, they were traveling to work and God forbid they had a car accident and now suffered a continuing, uh, excuse me, a, a brain injury. Now noticing this fact pattern, uh, Janet is now living in a continuing care retirement community. She is now the surviving spouse. Jack had died 20 years earlier. She has a deposit. Hopefully that deposit was, if it's coming back to the estate, which some of them do and some of them don't, hopefully that deposit is going to be properly designated where? To her trust. Savings and checking and cash, look at that. The IRAs have grown. The brokerage account has grown. Janet has her continuing life insurance, but look at this, the Delaware house was sold and Janet now has a Florida residence, okay? So now we're not dealing with Delaware, but we're dealing with the potential for ancillary probate in Florida. Hopefully that Florida residence is titled into the trust. There still were no lifetime gifts, but for some reason, and this is very unusual fact pattern, Janet has some creditors. It could be credit card debt, it could be that uh, Janet was enjoying going to Atlantic City uh, or uh, going to some casino and, and, and gambling. You never know what the situation might be, as funny as that may sound. So she has creditors. So what would we do here with this fact pattern? Well, now we have the death of the surviving spouse. We are still going to follow this trust checklist. We're going to use the highest and best practices of following a checklist. We're going to be doing accounting. We're going, to, and we're gonna go through this in a little bit more detail. We're going to be making a claim on the continuing care retirement community deposit and waiting for that to come back. We're going to, after her death, we're going to get a tax ID number for her trust. Uh, we are going to take a look at the total size of the estate and whether we have any estate tax issues. We're going to see if anything is in probate, if there's anything outside the trust that shouldn't have been outside the trust. Um, we are going to make a death claim for the children on the IRAs, but when is that death claim due? By the fall of the year following her death. We are going to go through all of those motions and look at the bottom bullet point. Everything goes to the children equally in a further trust, in a further trust. Now, that means that even the IRAs are probably beneficiary designated to trusts for children. Why did Jack and Janet leave trusts for children? Probably for the protection of the children from divorce, uh, creditors gen generally, car accidents, um, bankruptcy. So those trusts have to be funded. And if the IRAs have been left into those trusts, the inherited IRAs have to be set up into those trusts. Okay, and that's a process that needs to, be, to take place in a certain way. It's not easy to deal with some of the custodians after the death of Janet here. 
look at this really bright flashing red light. One of the child, excuse me, one of the children is disabled and they have a brain injury. So let's assume that this person uh, as an adult is now on social security disability or they're severely disabled and cannot continue to work. And the question is, do we distribute that, that person's uh, IRA and distribute that person's share into their regular general trust? That is probably the trust that was left by Janet and Jack for that child. Or does that, does that asset have to go into a separate kind of trust, a special needs trust? And if necessary, that child's trust could be decanted. Now, hopefully this trust is a modern trust that Janet kept up. And hopefully the trustee has some options about how to, how to deal with people who are disabled. But if there are limited options in the trust, hopefully a decanting, which is allowed by about 25 or maybe half the states, Maryland does not have decanting, but I think it would be the fiduciary's responsibility to make sure this child gets their share in the proper way and not in a way, or at least think, of, think through the issue, not in a way where all the money could be depleted due to long-term care costs, given the situation that this person might be living in. So here we have no inheritance tax if this is a Maryland trust, because everything is going to, um, you know, to lineal descendants. We have a bit of a blip here with that injury to the child, but otherwise we have a checklist. We would work through this checklist, file Janet's final tax returns, make sure that the CPA or attorney is doing the fiduciary income tax returns and basically getting from point A to point B. And what do we do in a trust distribution prior to distributing assets? Always advisable for the fiduciary to make sure that all of the beneficiaries sign off and accept a copy of an accounting and that you are protected as a fiduciary and that the beneficiaries sign off and release you from liability prior to distributing the funds. So this may seem strange to some of you who have close families and you don't see the need for this, but you are entitled to be released as you would be in an estate when the uh, orphans court uh, and signs off on the final estate uh, accounting and orders distribution. Same thing in the trust world, you can get a release from liability. Our last fact pattern is we have someone here who was separated at the time of death. And it's a very strange, but not, not completely uncommon situation where the spouses live separately. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to go through this very briefly and highlight some of the things to look for. If we look at the very bottom here, we see that there was no estate plan. This gentleman, Ricardo, passed away with no will. And what does that mean? Does it mean we have no probate just because there's no will? The answer is no. There is still going to be probate because he has probate assets. So let's look at what those are. There's a checking, that, that, that's cash savings. That's a probate asset because we're going to make the assumption that this was in his sole name with no beneficiary. There's an inherited IRA he has, and hopefully that inherited IRA, hopefully there was a beneficiary that, that Ricardo himself um, redesignated during his life. Now, under the SECURE Act, what do we know here? We know that if this, this has a beneficiary, the further beneficiary, whoever that is, is going to have 10 years to take that out. The automobile, let's assume that's in his sole name, that's going to be in probate. Life insurance with no beneficiary, that's in probate. So unfortunately, this non-probate asset is now probate. Savings bonds, that's going to be in probate. And we have the same issue as we had in the first example. We have to go through the cashing out of those savings bonds, and we have to try to attribute the tax appropriately to try to minimize the tax. Uh, there were lifetime gifts. So this is a little bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an abnormal thing here in our fact pattern. This gentleman apparently at one time had a significant amount of assets to gift, and he did so. And he used some of his lifetime exemption. Let's assume that he had a $12 million uh, exemption from um, gift tax at his death. 
and he used 500,000 minus what? The annual exclusion amount. So depending on who he gifted this to, um, and it says here he had two children, so let's take 500,000 minus 16,000, which is the annual exclusion, minus 16, minus 16, that means that, uh, what is that, $32,000, he would have given away 468,000 of his $12 million exemption. But because he did not go over 12 million, there is no, um, there's nothing to worry about here. Even though he used 468,000 of his 12 million, there still is no, no estate tax here at his death. So in this example, what do we have to do? We have to make a death claim on the IRA for the two surviving children. And all of this has to go through probate. Uh, now here, uh, I'm partially getting a little bit ahead of myself here because even though the inherited IRA might have been de designated to the ch two children, and that would be okay, uh, there is a surviving spouse and we see that she lives in a different state and she's entitled to notice. She may make a spousal elective share claim. So we're back to the personal representatives checklist here in probate. She may make a claim and she may say, I'm entitled to at least one third of everything. So that is the new spousal elective share law from October of 2020. We have to be aware of that. So here we have a intestate estate. So this is going to go according to the laws of Maryland, which basically in so many, uh, we have to look at the, at the code, but basically this is going to give uh, basically 50-50 among the children and 50% to the spouse roughly. And uh, this, this may or may not have been the result that Ricardo was looking for. So my point of these first four illustrations that I've taken a lot of time on is to start giving you pointers of things that you would look for. This is kind of like a law school fact pattern. And you're looking at these facts and you're saying, how, how do I know what to do in light of these checklists and my responsibility? And hopefully what we've done here is give you a little bit of an idea about that. Jeff, we've gone about through about, uh, I'd say about 50 to 60% of our time on these um, examples. And I wanna to get to the other material. I'm going to stop now and see if there's any questions as we continue. Thanks very much, Steve. We do have one question, and the question is, do the same rules for IRAs and 401ks apply to thrift savings plans? Yes, the answer is yes. There are, there are a couple of little nuances there with TSP, but for all practical purposes, I want you to think of a TSP as a 401k and the SECURE Act is going to affect that as a retirement plan. And by the way, we're not gonna have time to get into this today, but the new SECURE Act regulations came out just a few weeks ago. We're still trying to get our minds around the whole thing, but uh, these clarify a lot of things and uh, they reiterate certain things that we already knew, um, but that's an important thing to know that the SECURE Act regulations finally did come out and uh, we're going to be doing a workshop on that on May 25th. Great, thank you. All right, we're gonna now just keep going. Having shown you those illustrations as a, as a kind of a foundational way of thinking about various situations, and there's an unlimited number of fact patterns and situations, let's get into some of the more um, narrative material here. So we wanna minimize confusion and provide support. We talked about that. So we wanna have empathy, for the loved ones who survive, surviving spouses especially, um, and we wanna have empathy for their situation. Uh, we wanna have uh, family support and, and we wanna determine what support they need. That I think that's a responsible thing to do in administration. Uh, remember, beneficiaries have the right to information, okay? And that's going to be uh, 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 somewhat of a nuanced thing depending on what the family situation is. If you are a professional, your whole firm should be um, somewhat, uh, somewhat um, uh, trained and understanding what families are going through so that all people involved in the professional side understand what the family is going through. You should be creative and you should try to make resources available to people. And we should never assume 
that uh, people that are in crisis have resources. We should we should make make the assumption that they will appreciate uh, and not necessarily have the resources that they need. And if we have uh, suggestions, we should make them aware. We should have the ability to act and refer as counselors and coordinators for things. Now, again, along the lines of minimizing confusion, we want to assure clients or the fiduciary, if we are professionals, we want to assure them that they should take care of themselves and that generally speaking, there is no hurry. Many times we will see uh, surviving spouses push themselves to the limit uh, to their own detriment and their own despair at a time of grief. And there's just no reason for that in most circumstances. Sometimes there are circumstances where someone has a multiple uh, rental properties and, and there's something that has to happen right from the very beginning. But most of the time, there's plenty of time for a grieving process and then to get the process started. All advisors should be working together and coordinating. This is the eternal problem that we all need to work on on the professional side. We want to assure clients and have confidence that they can have confidence that everything is in order, that funds are available, or that we're working hard to make funds available. And we want to make sure that we're dealing with final arrangements properly and making sure that payment for final arrangements is made. A lot of times funeral homes and, and cemeteries are very confused or cause problems inadvertently for the family because it's unclear how they're going to be paid. If there are family related issues, we need to address those. Many times there are dysfunctional family issues and we wanna make sure that we're taking that on head first to try to make sure that any problems that could be resolved are resolved. For professionals, we should reach out to family members, provide sympathy and expressions of sympathy and, and uh, attend funeral or memorial services. Now, what is the difference between the legal step-by-step -step process and, um, uh, and other processes? So let's look at this legal step-by-step -step process probate versus non-probate, we've, we've, we've basically talked about that so far. The probate process, whether there's a will or no will, we can still have probate, and what to do when we are dealing with a trust. And I did use an illustration of a married couple, so uh, think of the surviving spouse's illustration of what might happen with largely with a single person who died with a, with a trust. But we have probate versus non-probate. These are similar steps, but different use the checklist, and as we've said with redundancy, organization is the key. Now, we talked about this a little bit in the examples, now I'm going to go through the checklist basically. So I want you to just ride along with me now. We have the date of death and we have a death certificate, that's a, that's a big issue. We have letters of administration, and remember this is probate, we are talking about here what is the legal step-by-step -step process in probate. There's an inventory due, and an information report due. Why does, the, why does the Register of Wills want to know about the information report? They basically want to see, does anyone owe inheritance tax? So within three months, we have to provide date of death values. That's one of your first responsibilities as a fiduciary. There are things like the alternate valuation date and so forth. We're not going to spend time on that. Claims against the estate. Creditors have six months from the date of death not the not the uh, date that the estate is open, but from the date of death. By the way, can a creditor make a claim? Because remember in my example with Janet, she had creditors, but she has a revocable trust. Can creditors make claim against a revocable trust? The answer is yes. Back to wills or probate, uh, there's a spousal election. We know that's the new augmented estate. And we talked about that last example where a spouse could make a claim for her spousal elective share. Okay, so that's something that has to be done within a certain period of time. Disclaimers, which are basically tax elections most of the time, that has to be done within a certain period of time, at least for tax purposes. And we know that federal and state, federal and state estate tax returns have to be filed within nine months. And there can be an extension, but that is a very case by case issue. A Q-tip election has to be made within 15 months. We talked about that being the marital trust election. 
the portability election now can be made within 24 months. I wouldn't wait that long if I were you, uh, but that is the, the law. We have 24 months to do that. Uh, the portability election for the surviving spouse. The first administration account is due within nine months. Subsequent accounts are due later. So you don't have to close a, a probate estate within nine months. You can go into other accounting periods. And then the release of liability for the personal representative or trustee. And then we talked a little bit about retirement plan accounts and the timeline. So there is a series of critical dates at the fall of the year following the decedent's death. And we won't have time to get into all that today, but just remember from September 30th all the way through the end of the year, we have critical dates and don't wait that long generally to make these retirement uh, death claims and moving retirement plans into position where they're supposed to be. The SECURE Act again uh, is signed by President Trump in January of 2020. The new regulations came out six weeks ago or so. The SECURE Act basically says if you're healthy and well and you're a non-spouse, you only have 10 years to take out the assets out of an IRA. All of the assets will be taxed. If you are exempt, and there are five categories of surviving spouses, minor children, persons that are less than 10 years younger than the plan participant, someone who's chronically ill, or someone who has special needs or is disabled. Those five categories of individuals can stretch out an IRA for their long-time life expectancy, just like we all used to be able to. But the SECURE Act says if you're not one of those five categories of individuals, you only have 10 years. Now, uh, the, the CPA involved may a select a fiscal year for the income tax return. We won't spend a lot of time in this minutia, but just know that from the date of death until the time of distribution, Uncle Sam wants to know what? What is the income tax on the income earned, the income and dividends? So your CPA or attorney can complete that form 1041. The decedent's final tax returns and all the estate tax issues, if there are any, we want to deal with that. And now, as we continue on and trying to make sure we're making the most of our time, let's go through the same process for non-probate. So what are we talking about here to make sure that we're all on the same page? We looked at examples. Prior to that, we talked about the, the important things that I wanted to convey today. We talked about these checklists. We now just went through basically the checklist in bullet point form. Uh, for probate. Now let's go through the same thing again here for non-probate. I'm not going to go through every single one of these because we just touched on some of these things, but what you'll notice here, if and when we say non-probate, we're talking about a trust administration, and you'll notice here we're doing some of the same things. We are getting date of death values. That's one of the big responsibilities of a fiduciary. We're giving notice to beneficiaries. Now remember in a probate, those probate beneficiaries get noticed through the register of wills. They are interested persons. Here we are having to give notice under what? The Maryland Trust Act of 2014 says that these beneficiaries are entitled to notice if they're qualified beneficiaries. Notice to creditors. So here we're saying, well, we don't have to give notice to creditors under a revocable trust, but to me, a highest and best practice is to say, Anyone out there who is a potential creditor and would make a claim against the trust, you are on notice now that you only have six months to make that claim. So to me, that's a best practice. It does cost a little bit of money to do that. And many of you would say, well, the deceased person had no creditor, Steve. So why should we do that? Well, I just think as a best practice, it forecloses the claims of creditors after six months. Now, many of the other spousal elections are the same. Uh, remember that under the new Maryland law, under the new spousal elective share law, a, an electing spouse can make a claim against a revocable trust, against a retirement plan, and it's a formulaic um, piece of legislation, and it has to be looked at. So if the decedent is not leaving everything to the surviving spouse or not leaving enough to the surviving spouse, that surviving spouse under a trust still has the right of election. The Q-tip election, the portability election, 
All of the sim similar uh, bullet points here apply to non-probate just as much as they apply to probate. That's one of the biggest things I want you to take away from here. So let's say that you are a fiduciary for a revocable trust administration. And uh, you might say, well, Steve, there's no probate. I mean, I could distribute all these assets immediately. The moment of the decedent's death, I could just distribute all those assets. There's no probate. And I would say, you're exactly right. You, you absolutely could do that. But as a practical matter, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, you're going to want to be very methodical, those highest and best practices, get the date of death values, do all of the steps, make sure you've covered all of your bases, make sure you've accounted for all of the assets, because what happens at the end? You want to do a great job. You want to be exonerated, and you also want to be released from from any possibility of, of not having done your fiduciary duty, and you also want to uh, get that release of liability from the beneficiaries. You don't want to distribute assets to someone who could then turn around and sue you and say, you did not do what you're supposed to do. And you want to be transparent. You want to provide an accounting. So for all of those things, all of those reasons, yes, you could distribute immediately, but I would recommend that you not do that on, except for a few circumstances, what would those be? Well, let's say we have an only child and we have no other interested persons, no other qualified beneficiaries, and this is a very straightforward situation, then you can distribute much faster uh, without having to do um, maybe some of the jumping through hoops that you would normally do. But as a general rule of thumb, you wanna do what I just described. Now, we are just continuing here on this slide with some of the things I just said. You want to get a release. And you'll notice here, you can even ask someone to give you a refunding agreement. Not only release me and waive liability, but also if I were to distribute assets to you, but Uncle Sam came back and said, no, there's more tax due, or no, we didn't, we didn't know about this, and you now are responsible for more tax or other uh, issues have arise, arisen now, a uh, beneficiary must refund some of the money to make you whole again as the fiduciary and allow you to distribute out more money to the creditor or to IRS and so forth. So this release is very big, it's very global. We strongly recommend that you think along those lines. Now, what are the practical steps after someone dies? Well, like I said, we wanna make sure that surviving spouses and so forth have time there's generally no great hurry, but I would say within 30 days is a good rule of thumb to start the process of addressing things. Now, many surviving spouses will start sooner. Many fiduciaries will start sooner. Coordinate with all advisors. Use the critical dates checklist. And again, we're being redundant. Organization is the key. If you are a professional, you should have an inclusive process. Now, all situations are different. If you are a non-professional and you're acting as a fiduciary, I still think you should have an inclusive process to the degree possible. Keep people informed. You, if you're a, a, a personal representative, you don't have to give the beneficiaries every piece of information and every step that, uh, that you're taking along the way. But to the extent that you keep reasonable beneficiaries informed of what's happening, um, I think your life is going to be much easier and you're going to have the cooperation of people. Um, Again, you want to use due diligence with surviving spouses. You want to uh, be methodical but not hurried with the surviving spouse or if you are the surviving spouse. And many times surviving spouses are going to want to address their own estate planning. And this is a phenomenon that we see quite often. And we see surviving spouses trying to do this under difficult circumstances. We need to be sensitive to that. And uh, they don't need to do that too soon but many of them are very, very concerned about doing that, and we deal with many, many surviving spouses. So again, organization is the key. Traditional document storage is very important. What are we talking about here? We're talking about organization and readiness, okay? This is going to make your life, this is going to make your, your fiduciary's life much easier. Digital assets, do you have electronic archives? Do you have a digital asset spreadsheet? Do you have a hard copy? Do you have a safe deposit box? And can your uh, fiduciary access that safe deposit box? 
uh, are they an authorized signer or an authorized person on the bank's safe deposit box? It doesn't really matter uh, what happens uh, in your documents. If your documents say, or, or the decedent's documents say, hey, my fiduciary can get into my safe deposit box, it doesn't matter if the bank won't allow them in there. So we want to save confusion and save having to drill safe deposit boxes. If there are safes, your fiduciary needs to know how to get into the safe. So this whole issue of organization is, is another art that needs to be addressed um, in the highest and best way. Now, what are the most significant and potential legal and tax issues? Now, we talked about the practical issues, but what are the legal and tax issues that need to be addressed? Well, again, we've got prior to death situation and then we have the post death situation. So in a perfect world, you, or the person that you are serving for is going to have made sure that all assets are titled appropriately. We don't have time today, but what I hope you'll see in those four examples is that how assets were titled is a very big issue. When Jack and Janet had that revocable trust, the assets had to be titled properly in those trusts. The beneficiaries had to be beneficiary designated properly for everything to work the way it was supposed to work. And it looks like they did a pretty good job in that example. In the first example, it looked like Felix did a pretty good job. Ricardo did not do a good job. So my, my point in trying to be uh, very simple here is that whatever the estate plan is, asset alignment is critical. Show me uh, or show a fiduciary how the assets are titled at death and that's arguably the most important thing. That is arguably the most important thing, and that is going to make the difference in how your life as a fiduciary or your fiduciary after your death, how their life will be as far as organization or not, and how the flow of assets is appropriate or not. So valuation of all assets, one of the big issues is getting date of death values, okay? Some people want to shortcut this. I always recommend not doing that. Tangible items need to be valued because tangible items can be vol a volatile issue. Um, we want to not, third bullet point, we don't want to retitle accounts too soon. Many financial advisors in trying to do a great job for their clients will automatically start retitling assets in the name of a surviving spouse or the name of a, a beneficiary and they're getting ahead of the legal side. So you want to make sure that for tax purposes and for reasons having to do with how the documents are structured and what the decedent wanted, we have to be very careful not to retitle assets too soon. So a good financial advisor or a good collaborative team will understand we don't want to retitle too soon. We want to be methodical and we want to work together before we start retitling assets. Why am I, why am I emphasizing this? because I have seen many financial advisors quickly retitle assets in the name of a surviving spouse and actually defeat the purposes of the deceased spouse. The deceased spouse said, this is what's going to happen, uh, but that gets totally ignored. So I won't uh, expound on that much longer, but that is an issue and that's why I have it here as one of the bullet points. We wanna see if there's any inheritance tax owed, and uh, we want to make sure if there are people who are non-lineal descendants that are subject to inheritance tax, that inheritance tax gets accounted for and it's paid because the personal representative or fiduciary is responsible for that. We want to make sure, again, the portability election is addressed, the Q-tip election is addressed. We want to make sure that we foreclose creditors as a highest and best practice as I move to the next slide. We want to have a, a, a team, a collaborative team, the financial advisor, the insurance person, the CPA, the attorney, all of them are communicating and working in the highest and best way for clients. Um, we want to, again, back to during the decedent's lifetime, we want to invest that significant time, not only in thinking and design, but also are the assets going to flow, okay? All of you on this webinar have met someone who says, oh my gosh, I don't have a beneficiary designation on my $800,000 IRA or my $2.1 million IRA. That is a disaster waiting to happen. We want to make sure those kinds of things are avoided. 
In situations where there's an illness, the person who has an estate plan or the person who is depending on you as their fiduciary, if they're exhibiting signs of illness, it's very important to expedite things for, for obvious reasons uh, and making sure everybody is on the same page. We want to encourage clients and we want to encourage them, of course, prior to death to use memorandums of intent. What is a memorandum of intent? It's something that provides a roadmap of the client's thinking of their goals and values and what they aspire to for their loved ones uh, or want them to aspire to. And uh, it, it is a very important thing that can be attached to a will or a trust. And it also can give you, the fiduciary, the guidance that you need in the administration process and beyond. Again, organizational tools. We're being redundant, okay? Education of family members, okay? If you are on this webinar and you are thinking, well, not only how, how can I serve as a better fiduciary, but how can I train my family members as better fiduciaries? That is the key. Uh, I did a webinar or a podcast yesterday and someone asked me at the end of the presentation, they said, what's the one thing that you could impart based on all of your experience if you had to put it into just one sentence? And I said, without hesitation, uh, the education of clients and their family members is what really makes estate planning work. So this is a, a maxim that you as a, as a fiduciary and your family members as fiduciaries should, should take to heart. Have a systematic method of reporting to all advisors. This is not easily done. And if you are a client, I would strongly encourage you to really you know, demand that your collaborative team, first of all, that you have a team and that you demand that that team has a cohesive way of cooperating together. Disseminating information quickly after someone dies and making sure there's coordination and instilling confidence, instilling confidence that everything is in order. That's this, these are practical steps uh, that, that really are important. Now, as we wind down, and I was trying to make sure we could end by 11.15 just to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I know I spent a lot of time on the examples and my hope is that as we start to wrap up, that as you look at those examples and you, you, you listen to my kind of global overview of what I see when I look at those examples and the, the fact patterns and the, the critical things that jump out uh, and juxtapose those things with the checklist and with the practical steps. My hope is that you walk away with something substantive that you can say, well, I'm gonna look at these checklists and I'm going to take those four examples or other examples and I'm going to you know, really analyze this and, and I now know maybe 95% more than most people know about uh, administration. And as I wrap up here and get ready to turn it over to Jeff, I will also say that I've noticed a phenomenon and this is a very simple phenomenon, but no matter what we talk about today on this workshop and these uh, slides and these materials and these checklists, nothing can substitute for what I would call a visual illustration of what administration looks like. And this is something that uh, I've noticed that uh, is just a weakness in our ability as humans to, to really visualize without seeing the process, let's say on a whiteboard or other illustrations. So, what I encourage you to do, if you have questions about how administration actually works, today was an overview, a very broad, many, many masterclass overview of, of many things to start thinking about, certainly not e exclusive, uh, but certain things to really think about. But seeing this in person, seeing it illustrated, seeing the process of how this actually works through a series of weeks and months following a person's death, and seeing it on an, a visual illustration. And that's why I encourage you to uh, let us know if you would like to meet, sit in our conference rooms, look at our uh, very large whiteboards and look at some illustrations. Um, take, it, take time to look at your own estate planning or the estate planning of the person who died. That's very important to understand what the estate plan says so things don't get retitled inappropriately. There's nothing to fear about these kinds of things. I commend you for your interest in your um, scholarly approach to learning. Uh, we wanna look at estate planning documents. We wanna help you form a team uh, during your lifetime if you're a, a person who is concerned about your own 
your own planning and being efficient. We want to encourage you to have a team. If you don't have a team, we want to help you form one. And if you would like to sit down and talk about these things, please formulate your questions. It's We love questions. We love questions today, which I'm going to stop here in just a second to take questions. We want you to come in with a list and we love to answer questions. Um, we're here as a resource. We want you to have time to think. We want you to know the tools that are available to you. And we also want to educate your family members. Jeff, I hope I've gotten through on time so we can have questions. And I thank everybody again. And Jeff, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you as always, Steve. Um, wonderful job. And so now would be your time to get your final questions in for Steve. And we do have a couple that I'd like to go ahead and post to you right now, Steve. Um, and the first sure, one we yeah. have here um, goes back a few minutes um, and from one of our good clients here. Any special issues if our daughter lives in a foreign country, she would be an heir and possible, possibly primary heir. Thank you for that question. So if, uh, and it's uh, all based on facts and circumstances, of course, but my initial reaction to your question is to say, uh, my assumption is that your daughter would uh, come back and fly back and forth from the foreign country to administer your estate or trust and the first thing that comes to mind is I would think that they would want to, your daughter would want to engage professional advisors, professional counsel to help her administer the estate or trust, especially if she is a, a dual citizen or a citizen of that foreign country, um, because there are issues about who can be a personal representative and so forth. Um, but generally speaking, this is not going to be a problem. It's, it's going to be a bridge that can be gap, uh, crossed, I should say, a gap that can be uh, filled uh, by making sure that uh, your daughter understands that she has the right to hire professionals. That's, that's a very important thing, that she's not alone, that uh, she will receive guidance, for example, from us here at Elville & Associates. We'll be here to guide her and direct her and to represent her even if she doesn't live here at that time. So uh, that is generally not going to be a problem. Uh, there are just a few hoops to jump through, but she can engage counsel to kind of bridge that gap. And I hope that's a comforting answer for you. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, next question, and that this is actually currently our last question. If you do have those final questions, please go ahead and get them in for us. Um, Steve, can you explain the acceptance of life insurance proceeds after death from, there was a previous slide, a couple slides back. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. If I understand your question right, I'm, I think what you're asking is, uh, it, what if someone accepts life insurance uh, and, and uh, maybe maybe uh, you're referencing years ago, we, we used to see, and it's still very possible today, even though we have portability, which makes a state tax planning much easier, uh, where there were there was a day and time where we were very concerned about surviving spouses um, t grabbing the life insurance proceeds, so to speak, claiming it very quickly after the death of a spouse, which is completely understandable. But in doing so, they foreclosed any kind of tax elections that could be made. So let's say that a surviving spouse makes a death claim within the first two or three weeks of someone passing, perfectly understandable, but they did so without consulting the attorney or their financial advisor or anyone else, their CPA, and now they have actually received a check, they've actually deposited a life insurance check into their own accounts. Now they cannot disclaim that life insurance if, if that was something that needed to happen. Now, disclaimers for, for estate tax purposes right now for 98% of people are not really necessary most of the time because of the large umbrella of, of portability, the $24 million between married couples that can be exempted. But in the old days when we did not have portability, if a spouse were to accept life insurance proceeds too soon, he or she could not then disclaim those and make the tax elections that are necessary. So. I hope that's what you're talking about. And, and the other side of what that subject might be uh, is there is this issue of uh, a person died who's married. They said that assets should go into a trust for their surviving spouse for various reasons. 
But if those assets get retitled into the sole name of the surviving spouse and not into a trust for the surviving spouse, that's actually in contradiction or defeats the purpose of the deceased spouse's planning. And that's what we want to avoid. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, so I'll make a couple of uh, just brief closing comments. Um, if you do have final questions, please get them in now. Um, you know, we are always here for appointments for you. Um, you know, they are a series of appointments. Um, consider them your own personal workshops um, or webinars that are geared towards your personal situation as our attorneys and Steve work to help you achieve your goals. So. Uh, we certainly hope to, that you get a lot out of our workshops and webinars here at Elville and Associates and appreciate your attendance. So um, I have some follow-up to do for you. Um, I'll go ahead and send out the video and slides and the checklists again um, from today's presentation. Uh, we have a busy end of the month here for our webinar series and as well as May. Um, on Tuesday, we're going to be discussing VA aid and attendance um, offered by our senior principal, Lindsay Moss. Um, really interesting presentation on May 3rd. Uh, we have a caregiver panel. We've never done something like this before. Really interesting um, being offered by aging life care manager Ellen Platt, who's a wonderful friend of the firm uh, with the Option Group, does a lot of work with our wellness series, and um, very interested to uh, listen to that. So um, invitations have gone out for that. So um, please uh, look into that. Uh, the last one I'll mention um, for right now, uh, Tuesday, May 17th, um, is after the dementia diagnosis part two, um, part of our wellness series. Um, so much information um, in our May, uh, April 12th uh, wellness series presentation about it. We had to um, make a second part for it. So uh, it was uh, well received, so we're going to go ahead and delve into the second part of that. Um, last but not least, certainly um, May 21st on a Saturday, 8.30 to noon, our annual client event after two years is back, and it is better than ever. I'm so excited for it. Um, all are welcome to attend. It's going to be a fun educational event, lots of fellowship, um, lots of award-winning food, live music. Um, we're featuring nationally renowned economist, Dr. Anirban Basu. Um, he's going to be our keynote presenter, um, other educational presentations as well. More door prizes than ever. I could go on and on. Um, I'm really excited about it. I'm going to be emceeing the event. I can, always looking forward to that. Um, so come one, come all. If you're on this webinar, you have received a couple invitations for it. If you have any questions about it, please reach out to me. Um, if you want to RSVP to it, you can email me with your name and your email address, and uh, we certainly look forward to seeing Where you there. Is it, yeah? it is at Ten Oaks Ballroom in Clarksville. Uh, beautiful, spacious ballroom, um, just a beautiful place, and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Steve, any any comments, thoughts you want to share? Well, I'm just like you, Jeff. I'm very excited about the client event. Um, it's uh, D Dr. Basu is uh, is wonderful, and many of you have heard him speak before. And if you haven't, you're in for a really big treat. He's uh, not only extremely brilliant, but extremely funny. And uh, also, we're going to have uh, lots of music. Uh, we're going to talk about the Elville Center. We're going to talk about uh, retirement and and uh, how to think in terms of the phases of retirement with our good friends. Uh, a good financial advisor uh, friends at Baltimore Washington Financial Advisors. And of course, uh, Gary Greenwald and I will be discussing a legislative update. But Jeff, more uh, maybe more importantly, the food. Who's going to be catering? Well, catering is going to be putting on the Ritz. Um, they are one of the uh, great caterers uh, affiliated with Ten Oaks Ballroom. And uh, so we've got uh, lots of great food, um, award-winning food. Um, that will and be right for you. So, and more door prizes than ever before. I'm not sure how we're going to get through them all, but we will. Um, so it's it's going to be a great time. So, and I also have heard Dr. Vasu speak about six times over my professional career, and um, he is a really bright guy, and his wit is um, is uh, something that you'll be remembering for a long time. Um, it, 
it's going to be a great presentation along with the others. So looking forward to it. Hope to see you there. And um, again, thank you for being part of our webinar series today. Thank you to Steve. Thank you for all of our attendees. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon um, as part of our webinar series. Have a great weekend.